the again as I indicated the uh, intensity of the wind or the pressure is proportional to the square of the wind speed uh, and all, but I would emphasize that all surfaces are exposed to that wind induced pressure pressure on the roof is upward pressure on four of the three of the four walls is outward and if the if a door comes open or something a window comes open then you intensify that internal pressure increasing the outward forces so early on it was thought that buildings exploded that there was a pressure drop which there is in a tornado and if you get hit with a tornado it's the pressure difference that causes it to explode when in fact a uh, simply a straight wind causes the appearance of the building having exploded because if the roof is lifted off the walls lose their lateral stability and with the outward pressure it's going to force the uh, walls outward <coughs> so with a, a picture like this we we can cause by straight winds we can see why there was the thought uh, originally that that the building had experienced an explosion this again simply illustrates the wind pressures we've tested full-scale shelters um, to the uh, well beyond the design wind pressure and found that that they uh, in fact um, withstand pressures substantially higher than than we uh, design for uh, and even then there was not a, a collapse or a catastrophic failure but rather simply a yielding of some of the connections so there's a wide margin of safety there against the wind induced pressures uh, and we also have tested a lot for debris impact this is a typical debris Im debris field again looking at Oklahoma City uh, Spencer South Dakota and we see pictures like this over and over and over sometimes those missiles get inside even if there's little or no damage to the house uh, here you still see the things sitting on the counter so that house was not badly damaged but somewhere this debris got through and, and came in and, and pierced the refrigerator we test for debris impact resistance have a pretty sophisticated machine here it's a big potato gun really you you muzzle load the two by four into that barrel and there's a pressure tank at, at the end of it uh, so we muzzle load the, the two by four uh, has a, a sabo at the end of it so that it fits the barrel suddenly release the air pressure behind the missile and it forces it out the barrel there are some gates at the exit to measure the exit wind speed uh, exit speed of the missile uh, so we know how fast it's going and we can calibrate then the pressure to get the desired uh, speed uh, that's a very versatile facility it has three degrees of freedom can move up and down sideways forward backward and so we can impact the uh, target without moving the, the target there's a miniature of that out on our table in the lobby uh, if you want to shoot the missile there you can uh, we don't allow only our technicians to shoot the real thing so uh, you can come to Texas Tech and observe this but we won't let you shoot it there um, so drop by and we'll demonstrate that little the one out in the lobby shoots pencils not two by fours this is a desired result if the surface is hard like this reinforced concrete wall this is not simply a brick veneer wall this is a reinforced concrete wall with brick fascia uh, if it hits a hard surface like that the energy of the missile is reflected back into the missile and causes it to fracture uh, if it's a softer or a surface that yields somewhat such as a steel shelter typically the missile would put a dent in the shelter the energy is absorbed in creating that dent and the missile may simply drop to the floor without fracturing but again the the uh, objective is to prevent perforation and many concepts will do that you've seen these standards we have good standards to guide the design of safe rooms uh, the FEMA 361 for community shelters FEMA 320 for residential ICC 500 
for uh, is, is a standard that's a consensus standard as opposed to the uh, the, the guidelines that uh, FEMA has published the FEMA guidelines of course give much more information on how to do it uh, particularly the FEMA 361 is a very extensive document whereas the ICC 500 is simply a rather terse standard that's, that defines the required performance. And there are several other uh, codes published by the International Code Council and the reference for determining wind loads on structures is the ASCE 7. It's periodically updated uh, and, and we'll have a new edition very soon. Uh, let me describe the National Storm Shelter Association compliance verification process. It's the heart of our, uh, our uh, association and I think is serving very effectively. Upon application for a producer member, someone who's going to produce safe rooms, uh, they take a pledge to produce only those shelters that meet or exceed the standard. We don't want a producer uh, producing some shelters that comply and others that don't. Uh, so they pledge that they'll produce only those shelters that meet or exceed the standard and they'll put a, a seal on each one. They agree to abide by the NSSA bylaws and the code of ethics. And those bylaws include business practices as well as the, uh, the ethics. Um, and <clears throat> They obtain a third party approval of the design or variations from FEMA 320. Generally speaking, if you're building a site built shelter with the designs in FEMA 320, uh, simply need to follow the plans. If you deviate from those plans, make it larger, use a different material or something, then some testing may be required. Uh, and, and the producer agrees to get that uh, third party approval. Incidentally, uh, the National Storm Shelter Association requires that the third party be truly independent and be in a different organization than the designer of the shelter. So generally speaking, the, uh, the, uh, a, an engineer seal, uh, an architect seal will be dis required on the design. They are the designers of record. The third party is, is an independent agency that uh, simply uh, assures that that design is in compliance with the standard. And then we test for uh, debris impact resistance. And again, the, uh, uh, all elements exposed are subjected to the uh, tests. Uh, and the door is one of the most vulnerable uh, components of the shelter and we insist on tested doors. It's very hard to specify a door that will uh, be safe, though it can be done. So we simply insist on testing and many of the uh, manufacturers produce their own doors and have them tested uh, since they don't publish those designs. And then upon completion, uh, a seal is affixed and we file a certificate of installation with the headquarters of National Storm Shelter Association for each shelter installed. That seal basically states that I as the producer certify that the design, construction and installation are in compliance with the standard. And the National Storm Shelter Association is simply validating that manufacturer's claim. Uh, they, they need not make a certification for the uh, site built shelters because they have, uh, if they follow that design, basically they would be certifying that they followed the designs of FEMA 320. Our third party company in looking at designs brought to them has uh, revealed the most common uh, deficiencies in design. One, of the one is the failure to treat as a community shelter uh, the occupancy exceeds 16. In other words, you can build according to the FEMA 320 to a size to where it becomes a, 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 
a community shelter and it may be okay structurally, but there are other considerations that come into play as a community shelter. Uh, inadequate ventilation for maximum occupancy that you could get in there. Uh, improper placement of ventilation openings, less than the minimum opening for an access door or failure to provide an escape door when that's required. And, and generally a community shelter larger than uh, 16 occupants does require either a second door or an escape hatch and that's often overlooked. Uh, for underground shelters, steps and ladders not meeting the required specifications. I think in some places, some instances, injuries may be more likely to occur trying to get in the shelter than if you simply stayed where you were. Uh, neglect of the up, uplift forces in determining overturning and sliding effects, and they're very significant. Uh, failure to consider the hydrostatic uplift forces. So every time we have a heavy rain, we hear of some shelters floating out of the ground because the, the, the buoyancy exceeded their anchoring uh, strength. Fortunately, no NSSA shelters have failed in that way. Um, <clears throat> or to consider the overturning or sliding a shelter installed on an isolated slab. Uh, so if you, uh, if you find a shelter that bears an NSSA seal, then you can be assured that standards compliance and the commitment to ethical business practices are implied and the uh, uh, NSSA has committees, both a standards committee and an ethics committee, as well as a compliance officer who uh, are poised to assist with any issues or questions regarding quality. So we would like to uh, feel that the uh, National Storm Shelter Association is a guide to quality assurance and the processes we feel should be followed uh, whether or not uh, you're going to put an NSSA seal on it uh, so we would highly recommend those. Uh, there are many safe room options available today. Uh, certainly residential community manufactured site built shelters above ground, below ground, new construction for retrofit, and built with a variety of materials. So I would uh, make the claim that we can shelter, we can provide safe areas for just about any circumstance, uh, any situation. Uh, have a variety of products available. Some are on display here. Uh, for site-built shelters, the most common uh, Types of construction are uh, reinforced concrete block or CMUs. Uh, the uh, filling is important for debris impact resistance. The reinforcement is important for structural characteristics. 